Molo Sanbonani, hello, how's it? Good evening and shalom. Renand, good people. Welcome to another episode of Liberty and Friends. Hmm, it's on a Monday evening, unaccustomed as we are <laughs> to that shift in time. I really am thankful to you if you have joined us on what is a rather random time, maybe just to help us out, uh, because I'm sure some people don't know that we're on. Hey, hit that like button. Do it right now. Hit that like button and share the stream on your social media. Um, invite people uh, over on to here because tonight's conversation, goodness me, will it not delve into a very serious uh, issue that we are dealing with? Apparently, I'm buffering, according to Moonchild. Shout out to you, Moonchild, one of the moderators. Um, let me just give it 10 seconds to see if anybody else complains of that, to which case I'll try and switch. Uh, it's fine now. There you go. Um, welcome to it once again. This is Liberty and Friends, um, your premium week ending and news analysis show. San Bonani, welcome to it. As always on the show, we have a panel of guests who help us unpack the news week that was. And boy, oh boy, what a news week it was last week. It was dominated effectively, that's if you're paying attention, by crime issues. A country like ours, our beloved. South Africa continuing to descend into the pits of hell insofar as the lawlessness that we're seeing on our streets. And actually not just on our streets, but at all levels of society, including um, top levels of government. It's a complete, um, I mean, saw, um, S show, if you know what I'm trying to get into when I say that. Uh, with that being said, guys, my numbers are looking a little pop at the moment. Hit that like button, please. Do it right now. It is your only price of admittance here at the BDL show. Hit that like button and um, let's get into the conversation. Speaking about conversation, as always, we have a veritable mix of who's who's uh, on the show to give analysis, opinion, and of course to help us bite at those headlines that dominated the week. First up on your screen will be a chap who's been on the show quite recently, actually, but I felt I needed to bring him on again because he is, um, well, let's say a guru to me on issues of law enforcement, crime, and even gun rights. Um, he's one of two people, actually, who I look to for these, um, uh, for analysis, pardon me, and, and key thoughts on this issue. I'm talking, of course, about Ian Cameron. There he is on the show. Brad Ian, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sikha. Looking forward to it. I think it's crucial that we discuss this. I'm looking forward to uh, delving in a bit regarding Becky Taylor, our good old friend, and uh, and the mess we find ourselves in. And, and maybe we can chat a bit about the possibility of uh, of a federal police system. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. Thanks, and we're definitely going to pick that conversation up. Of course, if you uh, are wondering what Ian is talking about, it's on the BDL show last week's Wednesday's show. Very well subscribed show that was, because I think a lot of South Africans are keenly interested on solutions and how we can fix our SAPs. Remember, on the BDL show, we don't just waffle and complain about things, but we actually provide solutions and interventions from a liberty perspective. How do we create a free, prosperous, uh, property owning and um, non-racial society. What policies get us in that direction? I always bring you voices who speak to that. Speaking about a voice who speaks to that um, and more, and someone who I've always argued uh, as I began introducing in is someone who I also looked to on issues of all things law enforcement, guns, um, and our rights to defend ourselves. There he is, Gideon Hubert. Good evening, Gideon. Welcome to LNF. Leon, you're muted. Um, oh, okay, there we go. There that should is, be a bit better. Good, good, <laughs> good evening, Sasha. <laughs> good evening, Ian. It's great to be back. And it's, this is going to be an awesome conversation. Um, Dude, it's, it is it's a great lineup. Yeah. Absolutely. And you are definitely a part of it. Speaking about great people on here, there he is, Pratumo Denga, the host of the Man Patriot Show. I hope you guys are uh, subscribed over there. Dumo, good evening. Welcome to LNF. Good evening, Sile. Um, great to be on. And yeah, it's, I know it's been a while, but it's always great to be on this show. Thanks for having me again. Brother, you are a friend to the show, as the name suggests. Liberty and friends. Speaking about another friend of mine, a good mate and former colleague, there he is in the vile requiem, <laughs> sitting in the dark, um, maybe a foreboding 
message, given what we're going to be discussing tonight. Marius Roet, brother, welcome to LNF. How's it, Sikhle? How's it, guys? Looking forward to it. Good to, good to see you. Uh, okay, little awkward moment there. Sorry about that, Marius. I should have filmed uh, <laughs> <laughs> by saying something. My bad, homie. Um, last face, of course, but definitely not the least, a fellow who you guys... I know he's a firm favorite on here, if I judge by the comment section. He was once described by a former colleague as having a sultry voice that puts farm ladies to sleep. There he is, Nicholas Larimer. I'm not sure I like this Nick whole sultry voice thing. <laughs> Nicholas Larimer, one half of the two crickets in a thorn tree podcast. Nick, good evening. Welcome to LNF. How's it, Sife? Um, I'm happy to always come onto the show as long as you don't call my voice sultry. Yeah, there you go. Some farm lady out there's like, yo. <laughs> okay, hang on. I'll let it go. I'll let it go. Uh, um, speaking about letting things go, that seems to be the trend in this country insofar as how we treat our criminals. We simply let them go, um, you know, for a myriad of reasons, from a failure to collect forensic ev uh, ev um, evidence, pardon me, because SAPs have not paid the contract for that, a failure to keep information Oh no. That, that's he shouldn't that's have made my... that comment about your voice, Nicholas. Acute <laughs> <laughs> bad karma or something. <laughs> yeah. uh, He'll be back. He'll be um, back. He'll be back. Yeah, we're He'll not be back. doing that tonight. Definitely there not doing go. that tonight. Um, okay, <laughs> I'm back, people. I just had to switch from uh, Vodacom's trashy 4G. Uh, yes, I've just mentioned brand names. Vodacom's trashy 4G to the Wi-Fi, which will probably be as trashy, but at least a bit more stable. Uh, um, sorry about that. I was building into this particular conversation because there is a context behind what we're going to be discussing tonight, a sheer failure by the state to provide that constitutional right, of course, of safety and security. And now a move towards the individual having to take the lead in that regard. Ian, we spoke about this uh, last uh, week on Wednesday, didn't we? Uh, and, and what just happened now happened then, which is we got cut off, uh, which was at that point in the conversation around, you know, there is a, a big conversation to be had around individuals in this country taking responsibility for their own safety. Absolutely. So, um, so I know Gideon and I, actually a few of us, spoke about the, the, the whole unrest situation earlier this year. And I think it, it actually just highlighted uh, the, the importance of strong and well-organized community safety structures in South Africa. Uh, let's make it very clear, if it wasn't for communities that were well-organized or at least stepped forward and said, we are taking ownership for our livelihoods and, and possibly sustainable futures, uh, then, uh, then nothing would have, would have changed. The, the government lost complete control because of ANC in, in fighting, it just turned into an absolute chaotic tragedy. Mm. Um, and, uh, and these communities stepped forward. So, so absolutely, I think the foundation of community safety must always be just that, the community. It's crucial that communities have strong communication structures, that they have strong uh, reaction or rather proactive groups as well that they can stop many of these crimes before they happen. And, and, and may I say, that's not encouraging vigilantism. That's just yes. encouraging good old looking after myself, my family. And once you can do that, you can start defending your, your community. And if it wasn't for that, South Africa would look quite different today to what it did, uh, to what it might have. So, um, so I think crucial, crucial that we can talk about that. I think the last thing mm. I just want to mention is that this whole talk about the possibility of, of federal policing will slot mm. in with that quite well because we see that the the areas that are open for local strong community-based policing structures are uh, very supportive of neighborhood watches farm watches mm. that type of thing so it shouldn't be a problem and for that reason we should support that federal type of idea even more Absolutely. I had to begin with you, Ian, because, you know, we, we really didn't finish this conversation in a, you know, lacquer last time because of the, the internet um, sort of failing me. 
Um, but even as I say that, th there's something you mentioned which should really scare someone. And really, I got goosebumps even as you said it, which is, you know, the fact that there are South Africans right now who have taken charge at a community and an individual level of their own safety is saying a lot given that it stopped us from descending further or at an even deeper pit of hell, the seven layers of hell, if, you, if I can characterize that, to which we're at le le level four at the moment. You know, we could have been at a much deeper level had it not been for those citizens already who have seen the writing on the wall. Because the writing as things are, even at this date, is a very scary thing. And I want to get into the headlines uh, that we saw last week, which speak to me even mentioning that. Khidian, I'll come to you uh, when I do this. Um, let me just get into my software here. There we go. And one which I, I must admit affected me quite a bit, not because I know this person personally, but because actually he is someone who is a, uh, a, a mega resource. Uh, to the community of Umlazi, my home township. You know, he's an entrepreneur. Um, he's an entrepreneur. I'm not sure what happened there, but he's an entrepreneur and someone who is a job creator in Umlazi. I'm talking, of course, about Umax Mkati. There he is on screen. Um, and this is the headline that really shocked me and it really my heart stopped for a moment because I'm not in Umlazi at home. He's the owner of a, an establishment called Max's Lifestyle. Max's Lifestyle has become quite the tourist um, uh, venue in Umlazi. High premium, uh, voted one of the best restaurants in the world in my home township, believe it or not. And this is the guy who started it. And look at that headline, Max's Lifestyle owner hospitalized after being shot in Umlazi, actually outside of his venue. The motive, of course, I don't think has been found as of yet, but he is thankfully, thank, uh, thank God, recovering in hospital. But th there's something that really frightened me with this headline, Khidion. It's this idea that in this country, life is very cheap and that there is a, an army, because it really is a mercenary um, level of people who can be hired to just kill and eliminate people. And it's often the politicians who use them, but it's still a problem, is it not? Well, that's the th that's the thing. We've seen, I think, in the last few weeks, even um, down the run up to the elections, a, s a great number of what we can only refer to as political assassinations. Oh. Um, oh. I mean, uh, you've seen ANC ward councillors killed. You've seen candidates gunned down outside their homes, um, and this comes in the wake of the chaos of what we saw in July, which was unprecedented. I think never in the history of this country have we seen rioting and violence to this degree. That in turn came in the wake of the proposed FCA amendment bill, which sought for the second time since 2018 to not only remove the right from ordinary South Africans to defend their lives, their communities, their homes, their families, those elements that are clearest to them and therefore by implication defend their right to life, their life, their right to bodily integrity, their, their right to human dignity, their right to property, all these constitutional rights, remove from them the ability to defend those rights by use of, of legitimate lawful armed force and essentially put in a whole bunch of other provisions in that bill that would just neuter civilian farm ownership entirely. The same civilian farm ownership that came to the rescue in KZN and Gauteng in those rights. Um, and that is something that has now, as we've seen on the executive summary through DRSA, where we analyze about 126 to 150,000 of those comments, those individual submissions, were rejected by approximately 96% of all participants. Whereas 2%, just over 2% did not fully agree with them and the remaining 1.9 something percent uh, essentially um, with the, with the only number that actually accepted them. So there's a strong element in civil society and amongst the civilian population that accept that they are reliant on pretty much themselves and, and their neighbors as a, a significant layer of their, their personal defense and personal safety because the state has failed at not only its constitution mandate, but left such a massive vacuum in safety and security, and in fact, perpetrates through these types of assassinations, violence and criminality upon ordinary citizens, 
And as soon as you create a vacuum, nature fills it. And in mm. our case, nature has filled that vacuum with violent criminals. So, uh, And I was, I was about to say, it filled it rather dangerously because, again, and I'll get to that DSA, um, uh, the feedback, of course, from those particular submissions. I've got them packaged quite nicely here um, with, with the, the graphs and the like. Um, but I want to get into these, just the headlines that we've seen this week because they touch to different elements of the failure of the states. In fact, that very next... Um, uh, article, and I'll come to you, uh, uh, Nick, on this particular one, if I can just open it, goodness me, there it is. This one really piqued my interest, you know, um, let me just remove that comment, there we go. Uh, this one really piqued my interest. Um, here we have a situation where, you know, 50 foreign nationals, pr predominantly, or just all of them actually, from Ethiopia, uh, were kidnapped, as the story goes. Uh, and, you know, hidden away in Linasia, somewhere outside of Johannesburg. And one suspect, of course, eventually was arrested to this particular crime. Now, when I spoke about this in the previous vlog, I think it was vlog 116, I made mention that, you know, when I read a headline like this, I'm sorry to say it, but it, uh, I lost Nick, okay, there he is back. You know, when I read a headline like this, I'm sorry to say it, but it speaks to the failure of law enforcement also at our borders and managing the flow of what should be legal immigrants, which are very welcome. The legal immigrants are very welcome in this country. But there's something to be said. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on tonight. I'm losing all of my guests, uh, literally <laughs> losing them one by one here. Um, the big like, one by one. glitch with the software. We, but, we still have, uh, don't worry. Okay, I've got, I've got, I'll, I'll, I'm directing the question to us, I'm about to say. But, but Nick, there's something to be said here. It always, it always seems to circle back that when we talk about a crime or a, a, a particular crime in this country, it's a, it really is a failure of the state at some stage. No, exactly. And I think, you know, I'm a pretty liberty oriented guy. I'm not as quite as hardcore in liberty as some people um, uh, <laughs> are, but I, I think the state basically has three, three, three jobs. Defect, uh, defend the country from foreign threats, enforce law and order, at least most of the, most of the law enforcement order, ordering of law mm. enforcement, whatever, and uh, protecting the country's borders and controlling them. And South Africa effectively doesn't have proper borders unless you are skilled and try to move in legally. And then you're going to have to go through an enormous amount of paperwork. I had an American friend who told me that uh, when she got a temporary job to work here, she she was one of these people who kind of worked all over the world and, you know, been an expat in many countries. She said that to work in South Africa, she had to get a police report from every country she had ever worked in to prove <laughs> that oh, wow. she was allowed to work here. Um, so our system is exactly backwards, which is that if you hop the fence uh, over the Limpopo, and in fact, you usually don't even need to hop the fence because in many places there's massive holes cut into it from the cigarette smugglers. Uh, you can get in really easily. But if you try to go in through the actual process, good luck because you're going to be waiting Patricia for... <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry. You're going to be... <laughs> you're gonna be waiting for uh, uh, visas. You're going to be waiting for bureaucracy to move. You're going to be waiting for paperwork and having to uh, comply with big requirements. And oh. it's just, I mean, you can look at almost every problem in South Africa and find a way that it's connected to the non-enforcement of law and order. Um, mm. And... and uh, our borders is yet another example. They they effectively don't really exist, particularly the ones with Swaziland and Lesotho. Um, yeah. I knew a guy who forgot he wanted to go on holiday to Swaziland. He forgot his passport. So he just uh, hooked up with some Dhaka smugglers and walked across the border, but took him about two hours. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, they, they really guys, don't exist. <laughs> guys, I, I, again, I, I, I laugh not because it's necessarily funny, but because... It's a fundamentally serious issue. I mean, we live in a global environment, Marius, where you know there are international terror organizations that look at something like this and really smile with glee because it effectively means free movement for them. Um, and this is the point I think Nicholas was kind of touching to. Um, you know, it, it, we welcome the notion of free movement insofar as it, it happens legally in a, an efficient bureaucracy that is able to process people so they come here legally, right? But actually, you don't have that free movement for those people. For them, it's a bureaucratic nightmare. But for the criminal, the guy who doesn't care about the bureaucracy, doesn't care about the laws, it's definitely free movement for them. And we're talking about a situation where we live in a global uh, world where there's there's realistic terrorism, including on our doorstep in Mozambique. 
Uh, yeah, uh, uh, South Africa, we also seem to have an issue with even people who do come out legally to become citizens, they have to jump through so many hoops. Most countries around the world, they they have a clear pathway to citizenship. Like if you stay in the UK, say for legally for five to six or uh, five to six years, and you get uh, eventually indefinite leave to remain, you can become a citizen. Other countries are the same. But I've heard of uh, people who are married to South Africans been living out for over a decade, and they still can't become citizens. It's uh, gets gets a bit ridiculous. But your point about uh, international terror groups and so on is. I think it's well made. Uh, I think we all remember Samantha Luthwaite, the so-called yeah, black widow, who uh, she she I think she was working in a power factory or something in Johannesburg for a while, and she was uh, hooking up with uh, some elements in uh, Joburg, people linked to international terror groups and so on. So I think it's uh, definitely an issue. And uh, uh, one, as you say, legal uh, or migration in general is pretty good for a country, but it's got to be legal yeah. migration. It can't just be a free for all. And that's yeah. the thing. And as you say, so many issues in South Africa come down to just the lack of enforcing the ordinary rules and law and order and, and so on. And we we can see it's, it has so many other effects. Uh, I recently, I've been doing some research on the involvement of the police in uh, criminal activity and so on in South Africa. And for the first time, um, it's a report that comes out uh, every two to three years. We call it the Broken Blue Lion Report. It's yeah. the first time we, we added uh, this time uh incidents of vigilantism and mm. when we looked at people talking you know so people who you know caught somebody stealing a phone and then they burnt the guy to death whatever the case is i mean you mm. obviously can't condone somebody basically getting killed for stealing a phone but the people uh, people were often interviewed and they said what happens is the people can't rely on the police they get so fed up and when they do catch somebody committing a crime then the community you know they take matters in their own hands and sometimes things escalate and people get killed. Like I say, no, you shouldn't be stealing a cell phone, but you should also not be getting put to death, put to death for it. But we've had a if we had a functioning police system. This wouldn't be happening. Even if somebody's phone was stolen, they'd have confidence in being able to go to the police and what have you, or they'd know it's a very isolated incident because law and order is enforced. So I think, yeah, it's uh, if these uh, if, if we don't start with the uh, base issues which the government should be enforcing, we leads to lots of problems down the line, and we see that now. Absolutely. And it's funny you mentioned that, uh, Maurice, because, you know, here on the BDL show, we had, we had an exact example of that. Uh, last, was, was it last year in Cape Town? <clears throat> Whilst I was in Cape Town, uh, working in a community just south of Cape Town in, um, oh, watch me not be able to remember its name now, uh, just near Musenberg, uh, you know, someone ran past me and snatched my cell phone as I was literally uh, providing uh, first aid to someone who'd been hit in the area by a car. Um, now, the community was obviously all there, saw that, and were incensed by that. You know, like, how do you steal someone's phone as they're literally helping you? Do I want to come to you on this? Because Umarius raises an important point here where that same community, and shout out to them, really, that same community then mobilized, found my phone, found the criminal, literally tied him to a pole, um, and were literally whooping his behind uh, as they were calling me to come and pick up my phone. And, you know, luckily, I should say really luckily, because SAPS uh, responded and they took this guy, and I then obviously pursued the matter criminally. But here's the problem. That criminal matter then came back to me. The MPA comes back and says, no, there's not enough evidence to prosecute this issue. That's the very thing that sees these communities actually then take the law into their own hands. It's that sort of frustration. And we see it in our townships across the country, Dumont. Right. Um, yeah, um, the audio is a bit gobbled on my end, but I've managed to get what you were saying. Um, oh, no. Yes. Um, I, will, um, I will try my best here. Um, but w one thing that I've noticed is that, um, so, yes, yeah, South Africans are getting frustrated and the police seem to be a bit... Um, I wouldn't say useless, but people tend to just not rely on them anymore. I was watching a a, a very um, interesting documentary with Louis Thoreau, and they were talking about mob justice. And I think there was that one famous scene where there was an individual who was saying that, um, you know, when he deals with criminals, he deals with them himself. And he even got to the point where he even assaulted um, one alleged criminal and um, a mob actually went after him. And Louis Thoreau said to him, hey, but... Why don't you take them to the police? And he's like, no, if you take them to the police, 
Tomorrow you're going to see him outside. He's going to come back and rob you again. And they say, well, why don't you take him to court? And he's like, well, if I take him to court, he's just going to pay someone. And then you see him out there again. So at the end of the day, there's nothing that I can do. So a lot of citizens are, in my opinion, they feel that their hands are tied. And that's why, like, for example, when your phone was stolen and you told people that your phone was stolen, they knew the police were useless. And they're like, hey, I know the guy who took your phone and they got it for you. And it's funny they, that, the, that um, the NPA could not assist with this, yet the community knew who took the phone and they could return the phone back. I mean, what, it seems that the standard of evidence is just a bit too high for the NPA, in my opinion. So oh. um, I'm, I'm actually glad that you got assist and I'm glad that community is actually, you know, recognizing this as well. Mm. Uh, again, you know, even as I mentioned this, and before I say anything else, come on, people, I'm looking at those likes and they're nowhere near where they should be, hit that like button right now, please. Make sure that you hit that like button. Get my engagements, please, to about that 50% mark because it really does help get the show out to a wider net. Hit that like button right now. Uh, let me see. Hit that like button and literally feed seven kids across the African continent right now. None of that is true, but what is true is you need to hit that like button, please, right now. Um, welcome to it. This is Liberty and Friends. I'm in conversation with Nicholas Lorimer from Two Crickets and a Thorn Tree, also part of the Daily Friend publication. Marius Rurt from the Institute of Race Relations. Dumont Denga, the host of Man Patria. Ian Cameron, of course, who's from Action Society. Shout out to you guys at Action Society. And of course, Uchidion Yuber Paratis himself. Welcome to it, everybody. Um, let me actually come to, to you, Gideon, and then uh, Ian. Um, and I want to flight this particular image because this is the one that really freaked me out. This is the one that actually freaked me out. And I say that as someone who's heading, I'm currently in Joburg, and I'll be heading to Cape Town on Sunday. Uh, this is just the, the sort of thing you you read or see in movies, drive by shooting in Mitchell's plane, Mandalay. Um, seven wounded, one dead, three of those seven wounded are actually children, uh, toddlers, to be honest. Is this where things are now on the Cape Flats? Uh, Ian? Uh, yeah, I'm going to try my best. The, the, the sound is a bit choppy. Um, I'm actually going there tomorrow, uh, in not e exactly in Mandalay, but another area that's, that's uh, we just last night, they, they removed another body um it's it's indescribable how serious the issue with violence there is now i'm convinced and i'm going to say it quite blatantly that um the policing strategy there is a deliberate uh attempt by the anc to discredit provincial and and local government um it is absolutely a, a strategy where they uh make sure that resources are completely uh, um, just completely limited. In fact, the Western Cape has about 5,000 vacancies in the South African Police Service. Uh, it's the most vacancies compared to any other province. And that in a, in a province where you've got probably the most serious gang violence uh, issue, uh, the anti-gang unit was disbanded by, by Becky Tele uh, recently. And, uh, and the stories just, just go on. I think the worrying thing about this is the fact that so many toddlers and, and small children get caught in the crossfire. And um, uh, the specific area where, where I'm working tomorrow uh, and on uh, and in next week again, the, the major focus there is actually to keep kids out of the crossfire. Now, it's a great initiative where the city of Cape Town stepped forward uh, along with some community members and said, but can we um, start the, the walking bus initiative? And what it basically is, is they, they cordon off, if you could call it that, it's like a, a mobile cordoned off escort of kids to schools where the majority of the people that patrol uh, along the street with these kids walking to school are, are usually women and uh, it's remarkable to see the results because where they walk you just don't really see children getting hurt um so it's a phenomenal initiative and if we can build that out it's at least some way 
of being preventative, but uh, it's a long way to go to sort out the, the gang violence issue, especially when you've got a government, and I want to go as far as saying that is absolutely complicit in allowing yeah. some of the violence uh, that we're seeing to happen. And I, and I just want to say as well, I take my hat off to a lot of the cops that work there because the ones that I've had the privilege of spending time with really are, are stand up police members and uh, they honestly try very, very hard to do their jobs. They just simply don't have the support and the resources and they've got way, way, way too many dockets on their table. So long story short, um, the, the ANC is complicit. And uh, it's uh, if you don't cut off the snake's head, you're not going to sort out the problem. Absolutely, and I think um, absolutely, I think that's part of the problem here. Uh, and I must come to you, Kilian, because again, you know, we 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 we've had this conversation you and I offline uh, about the need to actually go in to the Cape Flats, the likes of your Kai Leaches, your Mitchell's Plain, your Delfs. Uh, in order to begin to do some of that work that you and I know are big advocates of, which is to get more people uh, much more conscious about their self-defense um, and not just the function of getting more people becoming legal and responsible gun owners, but actually rallying communities to be able to do the work that sort of Ian describes with the walking buses. You know, it's, it's always more powerful when local communities themselves take charge of their own safety in their neighborhoods, which then SAPS plays a support role and really the, the growing private sector plays a support role to that. Um, that's the sort of element we're not seeing at the moment um, and definitely one which is even avoided by the state. Well, that's exactly it. And, and, and for this to become a real initiative and for it to be successful, it's not about guns, it's not about tools, it's not about uh, community patrols. It's about a fundamental mindset change amongst individuals and those individuals then becoming communities where the mindset has changed, where we stop outsourcing these very, very, very vitally important personal responsibilities to state departments or organs of state that have proven that they are unwilling and incapable of actually performing them. I mean, we look at the South African police, and Ian unpacked that the issue hugely. Um, it's, it's a lack of resources. For example, um, I think the Western Cape Flying Squad for the entirety of the Western Cape only has four serviceable vehicles. Uh, there are no fixed wing capacities in the Western Cape at all. I don't know what the rotary wing uh, looks like because they've been grounded helicopters and crashed helicopters. So I don't know if there is a rotary wing capacity in the Western Cape. Uh, overall, nationally, we've lost 86% plus of our reservists. Um, there's a human resources problem, not in the case of a lack of resources. There are many good police officers, but frankly, there are great many that are criminals in uniform who don't belong in a uniform. Uh, and these, this includes colonels and generals. There's a severe lack of leadership. It's, it's a complete dysfunctional mess. So without trying to waste more time discussing it, reliance on the cops needs to go. It needs to become an inward looking community based safety and security structure that starts with personal safety and then ends with community safety and then you can scale that up and down as you need be and uh, but again you need to be willing to take those responsibilities on because it, it's a massive responsibility it's not it's not a small little thing um and a great many people are unfortunately not willing to do it they want to pay someone in a uniform to can make their community safe the problem is and Morris and Nicholas will probably be able to greater clarity here. Every single RR broken blue line report I have read speaks very gravely of the degree of infiltration of criminals into the SAPS. I mean, we've seen it not just with the guns being sold to gangsters and stolen, we see it in many other ways. Um, I think if, if, if we can reach a, a point of epiphany where we can break that, that almost cycle of self-abuse of saying, but the, we need to fix the police, we need to do this, this. My personal opinion is I don't think the SAPS is fixable. I think we need to start looking at solutions outside of SAPS, the, the DNA database thing where Action Society, uh, Ian on the side of me, they've done. They have been the only organization that have really been running with that issue. None of the feminists have come on board with it, sadly. Um, I mean, open up a newspaper and you have a problem. The thing is the solution is us and what we do. 
Yeah, see, see Claire, I, I want to jump in quickly. Sorry, I'm interrupting rudely, no, but ahead. I want to add to what Hideon said. Um, if if we're not gonna if if we're not gonna jump in and roll up our sleeves ourselves, then we can just as well leave it. There's no point in having a discussion. And uh, and I want to tell you, uh, share you a story about Lente here in in the Cape Flats. The lady that that leads one of the walking buses there, her name is Glenda. Um, and she's renowned in the community. Remarkable, remarkable woman. I must be honest. The first time I met her, she's quite intimidating, and uh, and and I, I've I've grown to absolutely love her. She she asks me for cook sisters every time I go there. But um, it's it's remarkable uh, to learn from her because I honestly uh, commend them for for being so motivated while facing so many dark debts every single day. I mean. I'm on, on some of their communication groups. And if you see the amount of bodies that those people are exposed to, it, it is absolutely astounding. You know, we talk about crime. That is violence on a next level. And uh, I spoke to some of the, the detectives and without saying their names, um, and, uh, and, and many of them have literally not gone on leave for years on end. And, uh, and they have three, even 400 dockets on their tables. And that's not one or two. That's many of them. Mm -hmm. So, so I agree with Hideon. I think uh, you need to look at that. That let's call it the golden triangle of community safety. Your foundation is always your community. You've got a smaller statutory force that you call the police, and you've got the private sector. And, and those three need to be in a in a in a very very synchronized motion with each other. If that doesn't happen, and if it's not focused on on the community, by the community, through the community, then we cannot win the fight. And uh, oh, there are many examples of it throughout the world. The fact of the matter is, when the community step forward, we see change. Now, I, I, I want to raise this issue, fellas, um, and let me just put it back on screen just for a moment. You know, immediately when we saw this headline, and of course, the the uh, the infamous asshats, the minister of police, a one Beggy um, does what he does best because I've almost characterized him as not being the minister of police, but rather the minister of visits and commiseration, because that seems to be exactly what he does on a frequent, a frequent level at a much more efficient level than actually empowering our law enforcement to deal with the crime. Where am I going with this? Um, th there's this new catchphrase that they've now uh, started throwing out. Uh, obviously feeling the pressure from a public that can see that crime is escalating out of control, which is they will, quote, activate the 72-hour response um, uh, 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 methodology, the 72-hour activation or response methodology. It's been 72 hours uh, on, <clears throat> or oh, pardon me, that's what they said with this particular case. But then I asked the question, uh, you're going to activate the same 72-hour response method, which we're not told what it really means. But what about this case, which has now exceeded those 72 hours, and we haven't received any feedback on this harrowing story, also on the Cape Flats, the informal settlements out in Kailicha, where three young women, there they are on the screens, Usa Sanga and Gasela, 20, Zinke Meloni, 21, and of course, Unam Bless at 17. Um, found murdered and shot really in the head, execution style. That is in a residential area of Kailicha. Mm -hmm. And we were told very quickly, and we were told that a 72 hour activation will be initiated on that, but no feedback on that. Ian and then Marius? You, you know what? It, it's, it's a lot of bull. Um, the government simply do not speak honestly, they do not do what they promise. And, and again, I come back to some of the cops that are then forced to jump in with an investigation with limited resources and limited yeah. support. And those are the, the, the few competent ones that are there. And, and, and again, hats off to them. I want to raise two issues. The first one is a victim called Chantal Maquena. Two, three years ago, Rockland, uh, she was raped. She's five years old, raped, then dismembered, and she was left on the side of a broken toilet. That's where she was found. Because of the whole DNA chaotic, useless state, I don't even know what to call it, that, that the South African Police Service has, has caused it to become, um, it took almost three years to arrest the suspect. Three years after what happened to her. 
a case that we are overseeing at the moment where we're involved in just outside Paul in the Western Cape and in Bikwini, Sipukazi Boy. She was dismembered. She was put in a trolley bin and then the trolley bin was set alight with her inside. The suspect was known to her. He was previously charged with assault GBH and he was out on bail and then he committed the murder. Now, there are many, many, many cases like that. If you look at the watching brief report, and I'm, I'm focusing a lot on the Western Cape because I'm focusing on that currently quite a bit. If you look at the watching brief report that they give you, um, it is shocking to see the amount of cases that are scrapped from the roll because the docket didn't make it to court. Literally, mm. they just didn't put in the effort. That they either lost it or they didn't take it to court. Where a little kid was raped and murdered and they do not even have the decency to just step up and make sure the docket gets to court. And the point is, again, justice is denied and another child faced getting killed or raped and both or both. Mm. Absolutely. Morris, I, I want to come to you at this point because really, and I think Ian is exposing it, it is... You know, Shakespeare's work always talks about the notion of appearances versus reality. That is the common theme in all of Shakespeare's work. And when it comes to a certain asshat minister of police in this country, it's exactly that. Uh, he's Shakespearean in that sense, where it's the appearance of always talking tough, having a throng of media around you as he walks about uh, in the aftermath of a crime in an area. But really, there's, in reality, there is no actual service delivery or very scant service delivery from his police service. Yeah, I think that's spot on. And I think a good example was uh, last year, uh, I think just when we were coming out of the hard lockdown and people were on a beach in Cape Town and Becky Clele was marching around the beach with, you know, police armed with shotguns and whatever you will. We saw some people who were chilling out on the beach having to, you know, like looking around like a bit bemused. And, uh, and, and it's exactly that. It's just trying to show that they're doing something, but it's, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's nobody cares. I mean, the, that's not going to change it. It's not going to. It's not going to help people who are actually facing real problems, real, real criminality, and so on. And I think, I mean, just what uh, the stories Ian was uh, recounting now, uh, it's 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 amazing how we've actually become inured to this kind of violence. Uh, mm. You know, in other countries, if we that would be on the front pages of every single newspaper, people would be talking about it at and in the pub and whatever you. But how terrible it is. And I'm just thinking now. Uh, it's not quite the same, but I think it's linked to it. I mean, two EFF, EFF ward councillor candidates were murdered in the last couple of days. And it's also, we just like kind of shrug our shoulders and yeah, okay, cool, whatever, you know, like whatever you think about an EFF person's uh, politics, they definitely don't deserve to get killed or That's whatever right. the case is. But mm. uh, yeah, and it's, it's it's insane how we become so inured to these levels of violence. And I'm actually getting goosebumps just thinking these, mm. the violence and levels of criminality that people face and we have it like if you're a little five-year-old girl in mitchell's plane you should be allowed to you should be able to walk to the shops and not worry about getting raped and murdered if you're an eff ward candidate you shouldn't have to worry about getting shot by whoever murdered these guys mm. you know? so it's it's actually shocking and um uh, gideon made the uh, said that he thinks the saps is uh, broken i think he's completely right but i do i don't know if we've uh, if anything ever reaches the point of no return but the problem is we need the real political will to fix it. And we obviously, clearly, we don't have that in South Africa. Mm. So maybe, you know, perhaps the solution now will be to create some kind of uh, federalized police service for each uh, province to run. I know the Western Cape government is starting to look into that. And mm. that's probably something we should have done. Uh, you know, in 19, I mean, I've made this argument before. Uh, South Africa should be in a federation since 1910, actually, never mind 1994. So, mm. but yeah, but. Uh, I'm <laughs> fair. Uh, the federal South Africa might become uh, inevitable anyway, the longer that uh, the ANC leads us uh, down the path it's taking us. Look, we're in a very dangerous place, therefore, even as I listen to you chaps speak. Um, Nicholas, I'm going to come to you and then we'll do more. Life is simply cheap in South Africa. It's meaningless. Um, I mean, we began this conversation effectively by pointing out that I can hire some uh, goons uh, to go and literally kill someone, the same goons, by the way, who have no problem themselves uh, accessing illegal firearms in this country uh, and at, at no threat, at no threat uh, from the state insofar as they don't feel a sense of, hey, I might be arrested, I might face the full arm, uh, might of the law <clears throat> as a hitman carrying these guns. 
Um, that's at one level, if I look at someone like Max, where we began this conversation, but on the street level, uh, various communities across this country, here's Mandalay, where there's a drive-by shooting, and really, in, 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 in broad terms, very few people even bat an eyelid, because it's like, oh, just another, just another cheap life that's been murdered in this country. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And you can see it in our stats. I think I'm right in saying uh, that we're ninth in the world at the moment or somewhere around there in terms of our murder rate uh, for the population. The only countries that beat us are com completely failed states like Venezuela or the gang-controlled states of Central America. Uh, nice. So I'm not surprised that we've gotten almost numb to the horror that's around us because so many people are getting killed. And I... You know, going back to your point about Becky Pele, the dude is he's, he's worse than, than doing nothing because he likes to try and capture that uh, sense of outrage that people have when we hear about the crimes that were, that were described earlier. And then he tells the police to do things like, you know, shoot everyone or crush their balls or whatever, right, which is things that uh, police politicians have said in the past. And they think that by using that kind of emotive, violent rhetoric, they can sort of substitute it for making the hard political decisions, which will require getting rid of police captains who might be politically uh, uh, connected or cracking down on gangs who might, you know, have influence in political parties, things like that. And uh, until, you know, they make, in a sense, they make the place worse then because then they encourage the, the you know, the cops to go and kind of be cowboys which is not what cops should be. <laughs> they should oh. be disciplined, focused, organized, and professional. Um, so, yeah, I, it, it's something that, you know, if we're going to get out of this mess, I think we kind of have to remember, have some perspective about how things are and realize that uh, we can change things and we must change things because this is not how things should be. Oh. Yazi, Dumo, I'm going to come to you because... I even caught a, a comment on screen here by Carl Boeta, and it, it rides off what I was mentioning earlier on. There's a reason I brought up that, that comment about being able to, to cheaply hire someone to eliminate someone, whatever the case may be, or even cheaply source a, a, a illicit, I'll call it illicit, firearm in this country. In my, in my neighborhood, if I want an AK-47 to have fun with on the weekend, um, I know it's a, a quick... 800 between 800 and 1200 rands and i have an ak that i can either rent for a weekend uh or alternatively if i want to buy it it's a cheap four to six thousand rand for an ak um in this country and that's the situation we're dealing with here where it gets really funny then for me, the law-abiding citizen, to hear someone like Upegi Tele talk about coming after me and my legal firearm, yet I know of people uh, literally two blocks away from where I live who are able to get AK-47, including grenades, by the way, um, at, at cheap at cheap rates. Sure. I mean, yeah, when you mentioned grenades there, I was, I was uh, very, very surprised. Um, well, grenades, I mean, very quickly, sorry. Grenades and even mm -hmm. uh, mining explosives for the cash and transit type guys. Big booming sure. market. Yo. And and this is funny because um it it just shows the the government's um either willful ignorance or they just, you know, very incompetent at the end of the day. Because the the reality is that um if you're going to be standing up on a stage and saying that oh no, uh, guns are a problem, then okay fine then go look for those illicit um firearms but they're not doing that they are targeting individuals who actually go the legal route to do the training you know who spend all that money and everything like that they make sure they get the license you know they make sure everything's on is in check and those are the ones that are being targeted and i think for me this is where um the the source is not being uh, attacked correctly and i mean like I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example so i mean where, where i live i mean right across where i live there's a there was a beauty spa there and there's a robbery there right and um in that robbery guess what um no one got hurt unfortunately but i mean fortunately sorry no one got hurt um <laughs> hey now now people will be like Dumo, whose side are you on now eh? That's, anyway <laughs> <laughs> but um, what happened was that the private security actually were the ones who actually caught the criminals. They had their own weapons and everything like that. They they caught them, and I'm just and I was thinking, well, this is very interesting because the police only came later on. They're only there 
to just collect, to create a case number and a docket, and then they go back. But they're not there in to prevent crime. And then I'm just thinking, you know, now at the same time, you, you also have um, another source of weapons where people can just hire guns and everything like that and, 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 and do whatever. And yet, the, you know, you don't hear Peggy Kele talking about that, you know. Mm. That for me is very worrying because what it shows is that it's either he's very incompetent or he's being willfully ignorant. And he's being asked to just push this anti-gun rhetoric because, hey, if he does and he gets the law passed, he'll probably get a bonus at the end of the day anyway. So it just shows really that these guys are probably out of touch with reality. Or not, not probably. They are out of touch with reality. Uh, and let me speak to that reality, fellas. I'm sorry to sort of grind this one out slowly. We'll get to the meteor bits, uh, Gideon in particular, around what we do to push back. Uh, Ian in particular, what we do to restructure governance um, and Marius in particular, insofar as how we reshape policing in this country. I will get to that, fellas. Please bear with me, because on this show, remember, we look at the headlines that made the news, the news that made uh, last week. And the big issue, which cannot be escaped, uh, of course, is uh, down in Port Elizabeth, or a.k.a. Ekebecha. Um, let me open this up. Here are the sort of images you saw uh, on the streets of that particular uh, city, in particular Durban Road, a very popular th through fair, uh, through PE. Uh, that top little slide over there, or top image, pardon me, is taxis that were then engulfed in flames after residents of that part of the world, foreign nationals, it was said, um, re you know, retaliated to what were taxi drivers who had initially in the day had an altercation after knocking down uh, a resident in that part of the world, or a local Somalian in that part of the world, and escalated to the point where, you know, not only were the taxi guys then assaulting various people in that neighborhood, uh, the people then defended themselves, retaliated against the taxi guys, and that's that sort of middle image you're seeing in the middle there, um, including some, uh, and I must mention this because uh, it was said to me by sources who are on the ground. Uh, the people you see in that image are actually lawful firearm owners. They're, those are not vigilantes or uh, as the media sort of painted them. Those are actually local shop owners uh, who are responding to the violence by the taxi guys in the area. And of course, that last image at the bottom, after all of the reactions were over and indeed the peace talks, so to speak, were, were underway, that asshat, uh, who you see in the, of the beige suit and the beige hat, then rocks up and inflames the whole situation once again by asking police to uh, illegally, effectively illegally raid shops. That's the other part which raised tensions in PE. Guys, it's, it's just a cluster F, um, a cluster F of a mess where really Upeitel and the states aren't even seen as a solution when something like this does happen. And I want to quickly put up another image because I'll come to you, Khedion. Um, you know, if you think it was just PE that was going nuts, um, Johannesburg just last week was a similar scenes where taxis in that part of the world um, up in flames because of a route dispute, specifically in this instance uh, between the Nansfield Dube uh, Association, of course, the Vitz African Taxi Association, all out war effectively, to which the state's best response is, oh, we'll go to court and get an interdict to stop you guys fighting. Guys, this is the the, 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 the state of things in the country. It's absolute anarchy, Gideon. It really is. So when the National Commissioner back in 2018 said that it is impossible for the SAPS October 20 to fulfill its constitutional mandate, that came in the wake of a long-run decline in the capacity of the service to actually do their jobs, primarily which is secure the citizens of the Republic and their property. Um, mm -hmm. This is just this is just a natural consequence of it. I mean, we've had erosion upon erosion of law enforcement resources, ability to manage, ability to respond. You know, we've had this we've had this discussion, and Morris rightly points out they should have been federalized. Well, <laughs> South Africa should be federalized in 1910. The South African Police Service should be federalized in 1994. When you have a centrally managed police force that treats problems in rural KZN the same as in the city bowl of Cape Town, because we're all about centrally managing everything and deploying resources from the middle and have it turn into this corrupt, inefficient mess that it is where the good cops leave and the bad cops stay behind. This is going to be it. And I mean, 
we talked about the, the 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 kids that were mowed down at that party in Mitchell's Plain. We talked about um, the kids that have gotten raped and murdered. The fact that that the failure of the state to bring the perpetrators to book and convict them, it's not just justice denied to the victim and their families. That is the creation of new victims because those perpetrators are going to go out there and they're going to do it again and they're going to do it again and they're going to do it again until eventually, you know, they they mess up so bad that even this inept system manages somehow to convict them and lock them up or until they run out of luck and they get killed in the process of committing their crime. And the, the problem with the present system in South Africa is these guys aren't going to stop committing acts of violence because they're suddenly going to develop some moral fiber where they're going to go, all right, you know what, my everything I've done up until now is really bad and evil and I feel really horrible about all the murders and rapes I've committed. So I'm going to now have this road to Damascus moment and change my way. The reason why people stop doing violence like those is because violence becomes expensive because the consequences are very real and almost guaranteed. And if you know the government isn't going to, the this, this response of the state and their resources aren't going to hold any meaningful consequences for you or any expensive consequences for you, the victims better have the capacity or rather the potential victims better have the, the capacity to, to be expensive targets because otherwise it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. And mm -hmm. I mean, ta taxi violence isn't traditional um, criminal predation. This is a whole different animal on its own with a very very different history but it's again a function of this complete vacuum of law and order which absolutely yeah mm, mm. no i'm sorry i mean to catch your train of thought because even if you ask taxi owners themselves they'll, they'll say exactly the same thing which is there is a failure of the state playing that referee role which therefore sees um, in their own industry as taxi owners you know the biggest guy with the most guns uh, bullying and 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 um, uh, what's in English? Um, harassing the smaller guys, and that's often what starts a lot of the conflict. It isn't that they are predisposed to violence or they enjoy the violence. It's there is a lack of there being a referee, so to speak, um, in the various industries. Because you know, I, I'm a big proponent of this industry. I used to work in this industry. That's where I made my first few cents as a young man. So I understand this industry particularly well. Um, you know, these are good people, everyday working South Africans, you know, regardless of the beef we have with the way in which they drive. Um, but these are people who are making an, earnest, uh, an honest living. And for them, they hate the fact that the industry they work in is predisposed to these sort of violent scenes. Nick, Can I, I want to come... Uh, sure, in sure. before that, let us also remember that these very same taxi people came to the rescue of many communities during yeah, what boy. happened in July. Okay, so before I start painting people across the, uh, that, that's not my intention. Sure. Um, and as much as I swear at them in traffic, they have done amazing things for community <laughs> safety. And the second thing is just to answer William, no, no death penalty. I, I think it's an absolutely terrible idea to give any state and especially the state, the ability to put citizens to death. Oh, I didn't see that coming. I'll probably put it on screen in a moment. Nicholas, before I come to you, it's nine o'clock, <clears throat> which means we've just crossed the hour mark on the show on this a 90 minute show. In the last minute, excuse me, the last 30 minutes of the show, make sure you hit that like button. I don't know what's going on tonight, guys. Maybe it's, it's the glitch in the software and I'm not seeing the likes, but we're nowhere near where we usually are when it comes to those likes. There's about nearly 300 of us watching tonight, but only 30 likes. 10%? Nah, guys, don't cheat me like, don't treat me like a $2 hoe. Uh, get my likes up, people. Um, I want to see at least 100 likes at 50% engagement. It's all I ask, guys. It's all I ask. Um, speak about all I ask, you know, Nicholas, and as we taper this conversation towards what can be done, before we do that, let's situate Actually, before I do any of that, let me just quickly shout out Deborah Olafia. But thank you for the honor of standing. Um, that's 140 Rand. Thank you very, very much. Um, and I agree with you. This conversation does rattle the cage of many South Africans, but we, because we're not talking about some faraway place. Um, this is our home we're talking about. This is where your kids go to school every day. This is where you walk to work, drive to work every day. This is where your home is, your, your, your castle, so to speak. Um, and it seems as though we're governed by a criminal elite 
who are very chommy chommy and buddy buddy with the Minister of Commiserations and vi uh, Home Visits. That's a one ass hat. Um, Nicholas, I have to come back to you because, you know, uh, and perhaps that's exactly who we're going to focus on for the next five minutes because leadership is the last, the, the penultimate thing I want to chat about here, which has been a failure. Um, leadership in this country sees a hapless asset like this one being at the helm of our policing in this country. And unfortunately, you know, I, I make fun of him and I call him an asset and all that, but even I am cognizant of the fact that this douchebag, this loser is literally, if, if I'm to be a little hyperbolic here, literally has blood on his hands insofar as his ineptitude and failure to deal with the crime wave, the orgy of violence I was talking about in this country. Where do we, like, what do we do now? Uh, and I'm seeing a comment here that a, a fish rocks from the head. We forget that this chap too was once fired as a police commissioner for having his uh, hand in the cookie job. But wh what's he doing back as a minister in the so-called new uh, dawn Ramaphosa, Ramaphosa administration? Well, I guess that exposes exactly the hollowness of that supposed new dawn which is that he is there because he represents a very particular faction of the ANC that Sir Ramaphosa needs in order to secure his position as leader of the ANC and that's why he's there not because he's a great leader not because he does anything particularly useful for the people of South Africa and that is exactly the problem is that so much of the country including the riots in July at least partially um, is governed by the internal dynamics of the ANC and as long as the ANC has this total hegemonic control over our political space, over our culture, over all these things, we're going to see this. Uh, we're going to see its its own internal interests um, prioritized every single time over the, the the rights of South Africans. And we're not going to get solutions until that hegemony is broken, and until you know a police minister is appointed because he actually can reform and. Uh, repair the shattered police force. I mean, looking at all the stuff uh, that Becky Kele has done over the years, all the kind of incompetence, all of the times he's sort of inflamed racial tensions, all of the times he's, you know, the the, the thing he was fired for, which is allegedly being involved in this uh, uh, building lease, uh, dodgy building lease stuff. Imagine you're a low level police officer who just wants to do your job. And you look at this and you look at the senior officers and they're not doing their jobs and you think, why do I even bother? Mm. Um, guys, I I'm just taking a, a look at time. Um, I'll come to everybody else, but I want Ukhidion to open up this particular account insofar as, you know, we've been talking about the police, we've been talking about the collapse of the state, and I see we've lost U Ulo. Um, U U Ian, and I'm sure you'll come back just now. Um, oh, okay, so actually Ian had to love and leave us. Um, that's Ian Cameron, of course, from Action Society. Shout out to Ian, of course, he did say he had to leave at 9 p.m. I really appreciate his having been on here. Um, but it's also good because, you know, Khidian, the conversation will gravitate towards you for a moment. Um, we, we've had that conversation about what saps. Uh, and Morris, please prep yourself because I want you to also speak about some of those interventions the IRR proposes on how we can get safety and security right in this country through that liberty lens. Um, but let's begin here. Because for me, the individual is where this begins. And the individual in my book needs the tools to be able to defend himself. Unfortunately, um, or fortunately, pardon me, the most effective tool we have is a firearm. We all know this, it's a force multiplier. It helps someone who is quote unquote vulnerable, whether they physically handicapped, maybe smaller in frame, uh, maybe even an elderly person to be able to deal with a criminal who is much stronger, much quicker, whatever the case, Maybe we know firearms have an important role in this regard. But Khidian, as you mentioned, the Firearms Control Amendment Bill uh, being proposed by the ANC, the government, and really the ASAT, seeks to take away our rights um, to, to access those firearms, especially for self-defense. You guys ran a poll, not a poll, pardon me, but you guys asked a few questions on this. I'm going to put it on screen in terms of the, uh, the, the, the feedback. Uh, if you're wondering, dear South African, what I'm talking about, here it is. Oh, let me just remove my comment. Pardon me, fellas. Um, let me just remove that. Uh, this is the feedback from effectively giving you the ability to have your say. And uh, 
the first graph I want to put on screen, Gedeon, is this one. When you ask the questions to South Africans, do you support this amendment to the Firearms Control Act? Talk us through this. So this was a, a full-blown public participation process. Every single one of these submissions went to the Civilian Secretariat of Police where that proposed amendment bill or that draft amendment bill originated from as part of their call to comment that lasted a month and then was extended by a further 30 days. And we got, jeepers, we had about 150,000 individual submissions of which 126,000 plus came from... Uh, how should I put unique individuals? Um, and we analyzed at this stage just under 100,000 of those 126,000. And that's going through all the comments. So these ones we selected here are ones where people actually commented. Now, the ones where they didn't comment, where they just clicked through uh, and selected answers, those we looked at as well, those also count. But the relationship held. I mean, we're having a, a we talk about 100,000 submissions here. Nearly 96, or for all intents and purposes, 96% of all participants who registered their, their submission regarding the commentary regarding this bill rejected it. Um, obviously, 2% said, yes, they do, and another 2% says, not fully. They were kind of on the fence. And then, obviously, as you read some of the comments, um, a lot of the yes, I do comments were people who misunderstood the process, and they actually don't, as you can judge by the comment, which is why I put the comments in there. But this, this indicates that a great proportion of South African civil society, up to 95% of it, unless we say selection bias, but that's not really relevant, um, oppose wholly the, the government's attempts to, to disarm the public. And I think, you know, th they say events supersede debates. The events in July certainly superseded it. And I think that that was merely just the tip of the iceberg if you look at, at what happened in South African society as a whole. And I think I would like to emphasize that this isn't just about guns. I mean, I cannot contest the fact that a firearm is the most efficient, best suited modern tool for personal defense. But it also has a lot to do with the mindset and abilities of the wielder that, that is the responsibility of the wielder to acquire, is that, that proficiency and that competency. And that's where obviously what I'm doing for a living these days comes in. And the fact that the, every or almost every ordinary person has the capacity to acquire the necessary skills and mindset to do it. The fact is that this assault on, on farm ownership rights isn't, isn't purely about, in fact, has, was never about public safety. Um, the documents or supposed research it was based on uh, was manufactured because the actual research document, which came from the Witt School of Governance, uh, advised precisely against these types of amendments in the first place. Exactly. Um, so, the, so the state very hurriedly had to go manufacture its own research and did an exceptionally poor job of it. But the fact is this, is this is a paranoid government that is uncomfortable, very deeply uncomfortable and unhappy with ordinary citizens having access to guns because it wants the monopoly on, on the use of armed force. And there, as you can see from the top concern, of those that, um, that had issues with it, about 48%, 49% had issues with the bill in its entirety. And another 47% had issues with firearms for self-defense. And then there were smaller selections or, or smaller categories in there as well um, that certain people were more concerned with than others. But... This indicates a strong, how shall we say, it, very strong opinions pertaining the right to self-defense, as well as a very strong opinion about what was contained in this bill as a whole. Mm. 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 Uh, look, I'm, I'm just putting this up on screen. Um, dear viewer, you'll, you'll, when you want to watch this back, you can just pause uh, this and have a read at what is in this. Marius, let me come to you because, you know, uh, and I'm sorry, guys, I must sort of move us along in the conversation because each of you in the various organizations and uh, 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 podcasts that you run are always solutions orientated in what we should do. Marius, the Institute of Race Relations for me, uh, between you guys and Afri Forum, really are heads and shoulders above any other civil um, society organization insofar as the, the, the what now 
what what do what does the faith flag family and freedom type South African do uh, to not only protect themselves as an individual but really to protect their families because that's what we really are family society the, the IRR have proposed uh, quite a few things um, on safety and security uh, don't know maybe just rattle off top three or top five you know things such as you know uh, rebates for example if on, on security mm-hmm. spend uh, just remind me please of all of those uh, the, I'll give them to you now, but the sad thing is we've uh, these are suggestions we've had in just about every Broken Blue Line report. So it shows you that, you know, there doesn't really seem to be any will to really want to fix the situation. But uh, I think uh, uh, number one, as you say, is uh, allowing people who perform security upgrades in their homes to be able to get the cost back as a, a tax rebate. Also, yeah. I think very important is to make uh, neighborhood watch groups, integrate them with private security providers, but also let them work with the police at the same time. Uh, then the devolution of uh, police powers to uh, the provinces, that's also, that's actually a new suggestion that we've come up with, but it seems to be something that's getting some traction and within Western Cape government itself. And then uh, we've also suggested allowing communities to be more involved with uh, people who work as uh, station commanders, perhaps even going as far as uh, electing them. And then uh, the rest of what we've proposed is... Uh, you know, things that need to happen with the SAPS, reinstilling respect for the chain of command, for example, many mm-hmm. equipping ARPAD, you know, establishing a new investigative department within the Depart- Department of Justice, decentralizing decision making, but that's also part of um, the evolution of uh, provincial powers for the police. So there's a couple of things what we need to do, but I think the, uh, the theme is uh, more decentralization of policing in South Africa. And I mean, I think uh, Gideon hit the nail on the head earlier when he said, the policing you need in the city ball of Cape Town is not what the same as the policing you need in Matuba Tuba in KwaZulu Natal or whatever. Mm-hmm. So communities and needs to be far more, more more on the ground and more responsive to what local communities need. South Africa is a big and diverse country. You can't run everything from an office in Pretoria. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, I mean, that, uh, that has to be reiterated because again we're seeing. You know, people often want to be judged by their intentions. The intention or intentions, pardon me, are always good. You know, the assets will appear on your screen and say, oh, I have every intention of fighting crime. You know, I'm capacitating this unit. I, I've put, I'm a uh, on the streets and blah, blah, blah. But the outcomes are what you and I feel, dear South African, where I, for example, in Mlazi, I know I must be home at least by seven. Um, because if I'm not home by seven, I might be caught in the crossfire of various guys who, who found a certain container um, of millions of rounds of ammunition and are literally now shooting it up every single evening in Mlazi, uh, my home township. Trust you me, this is what's happening. That's the reality. Those are the outcomes of poor policing. Nick, I'm going to come to you uh, just after Utumo, um, because we're, we're going to change topic to the last topic for the evening. Um, and I'll begin with you two for this one. Um, Dumo, uh, today <laughs> on the Big Daddy Liberty Show, I, I ranted, I ranted, I ranted, I ranted on Vlog 117 because a certain uh, red in tooth and claw communist uh, who irks me uh, literally said this today. Uh, not today, sorry, last week uh, in the news cycle. Uh, let me just remove the bottom comment. Um, a, a, a one Julius Malema, who's on the road, of course, uh, for the local government elections. Have as many children as you want. Uh, in fact, up to 10 is fine. We don't mind because the EFF government will feed them for free and will give them free education. That's what a Julius Malema is saying in a country where already, already do more. The family unit has absolutely collapsed. And um, the stats, as I revealed, look close to this. We're over... 60, um, uh, effectively 66, 67% of children in this country live in either A, a single parent household, or B, one in five of those children have no parents right now at home. That same EFF leader, that same Julius Malema, then says, no, no, we effectively need more of this, where people don't really take responsibility for family planning because we, daddy government and the EFF, will look after these children. A disgrace, Dumo. Definitely a disgrace. Um, the The reality is that these politicians like Malema, they they don't see 
people as human beings. They see them as like cattle. And, um, you know, when you're a farmer, um, when you're thinking about cattle and how to, you know, how you're going to breed them and so forth, you can pretty much make decisions for all of them. And this is basically what Malema wants to do. You know, the, the more children that these people have and they rely on the state, the more um, votes that he hopes he will get in the future. Um, so this is um, like the strategy at the end of the day. What Malema wants to achieve basically is to create more and more dependent people um, yes. because that way he, they can win elections. You know, um, it's like what Peter Schiff said. Peter Schiff even said that welfare programs are just a, another way to create reliable voters. And the reality is that now when someone comes in who sees that these type of programs and these type of promises are actually deadly and they're not beneficial, my lemma is going to say, you see, this guy he wants to take away the very money that you deserve. And then those people will just vote for him. And also one more aspect about this is that the problem now is that um, because a lot of people in South Africa are poor, I think it's like close to 50%, right? Um, 50% the, the, the poverty rate, mm. 50% plus, right? Mm. Now, and, and now you mix that with, the, with democracy, you got these perverse incentives coming along. So now um, Malema knows that there is a grant that is available. So all he has to do is just promise a much larger grant. So now mm. it's, just the, it's, it's just a race of, you know, who can provide the biggest grant? Who can give me the most promises? Who can provide the most free stuff? And this is not going to be beneficial because at the end of the day, where are you going to get the money from? Are you going mm. to make the Reserve Bank print it? Well, guess mm. what? If you do that, we're going to get hyperinflation like Zim and Venezuela. Oh, you're going to take out a loan? Oh, well, I mean, our, our debt to GDP ratio is close to 100%. I mean, oh. we still have to service the other loans. So, I mean, the, the reality is that, I mean, I think it's election time. He just wants to make silly statements and get in the news. And this is one way of doing it. But any sane person who understands how economics works will know that Malema's promises are, are <coughs> out of order, in my opinion. Mm. And Nick, I must come to you because I really took offense. I really took offense. To, to, to this nonsense. Anybody who watches my show always knows that, okay, UPDL is all about faith, flag, family, and of course, freedom. And the family unit is, is, is the most important layer and level of society. It really is the bedrock that allows children in a society, um, especially if it's a two-parent household with two incomes. That is, if you want to talk about privilege, you know, you often hear lefties talk about, oh, white privilege, they'll say, blah, 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 blah or gender privilege, the patriarchy, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, hey, fuck, man. That's all nonsense. The real privilege in society, regardless of race, is actually do you come from a two-parent household with a dual income that allows you, ahead of the other children who either came from one in five, no parents at home, or the other 50-odd uh, percent, 40-odd uh, percent, excuse me, who come from a single-parent household where it's tough, for a single parent to try and match what a dual income household can do. The real advantage in this country is that two parent household. Now you have a situation where a politician stands on the stage and says, you know what, especially to unemployed youth, we need more of these children who will have a tough life. We yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of the cruelest, most cynical things I've actually seen from a politician in recent years, because he knows there isn't money to do this. He knows. And uh, his his response to the money criticism, because he made it, he said it in the same speech, was, "Oh, look, the government wasted so much money on uh, coronavirus uh, relief that that means that they could easily afford for anyone to be able to have as many children as they like and still support them." Um, and it's just a lie. Like, imagine a, if you are a loyal cadre of the a, of the EFF and you see Malema make that, and you're like, right, I'm going to do my part for the revolution. I'm going to have 10 kids. You are going to ruin your life and the life of all of your children. And, uh, you know, the points you're saying about two-parent households, I agree with completely. There's quite a lot of social science studies and that kind of stuff, which has been done to show that Big indicators of things like, you know, if you're a young man and you get involved in violent crime, a lot of the time it's because you were raised without any kind of sort of father figure or you were raised by just one parent who wasn't able to get prevent you from getting into trouble, joining in maybe with a gang or something. This is another one of those deep problems in South Africa that underlies an enormous amount of what we of what's going wrong here. It's not just policing. I think that this is kind of the flip side, actually, to connect it to the other point. 
mm. of, of, of perhaps why we have so much violence in South Africa is because so many people are being raised in a terrible environment and they just don't have, you know, good role models, good parents to, to, to copy from because we've got so many broken families. And it's, it's one of the great tragedies for South Africa and its history is long and complicated and goes back a long way. But man, <laughs> that's that's Malema is just being well, he's being himself, and uh, the EFF, the Everything for Free Party, is is being itself. And you know, fellas, I, I must confess, it makes me emotional because I was raised by a single parent. I know how much of a struggle it is for a single parent, especially in my case. My mother was physically handicapped. I know how much of a struggle it is and how much of a responsibility it places on you, the child, for example, to overperform in an environment of limited resources and even really limited opportunity. I know what it means when a parent has to cry in secret because they couldn't afford to take you, for example, or to allow you to go on a field trip with the other kids because there was a fee extra than what she can afford or whatever the case may be. These are real human stories that, that are forgotten, um, but at the center of them is the broken families that we see in this country. So again, I get incredibly angry incredibly it, it it registers on an emotional and personal level to me when i hear a likes of you let's my lemma say this nonsense because i can see and for a moment i'm going to put the race hat on just for a moment i'm going to play the game the lefties play just for a moment if you want to talk about the black child if you want to talk about the african child it is blacks and africans who are disproportionately the ones who, who face those no parent households and single parent households where there's massive poverty and massive struggling there. Now you have that, that is the current reality. Then you have a politician who himself is a millionaire, um, both legally and allegedly illegally for various VBS reasons. Oh, I'm sorry, did I say VBS? Or oh, I'm sorry, did I say old people in Limpopo who are missing pensions? Or oh, I'm sorry, did I say VBS? Or oh, am I keeping going on this? Uh -huh. But you have a politician in this regard who literally stands on the stage, looks at a sea of poor black people and has the audacity to say, you know what, engage in reckless and foolish behavior, such as having as many of 10 kids, because I, daddy government, knowing he'll never win, knowing he'll never win, will, will support these children. Marius, I'm sorry, this cannot be the politics that we're in at the moment. And perhaps maybe you see why I say hashtag politicians are trash. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm thinking Nick's completely right. It's, it's such a cynical uh, thing to say. And it's not the first time that Julius Malema said this. Uh, he said it in previous election campaigns. And unsurprisingly, it's always had a bit of a race nationalist element. He didn't say it this time, but I think it was the 2016 election when he also said black people need to have uh, as many babies as possible because, you know, whites are likely when blacks have babies because whites are trying to outnumber blacks in South Africa. I'm not making this up. This He, he actually said this. Oh, <laughs> I mean, anybody... Anybody knows if they know the demographics of South Africa, white people never ever outnumber black people in South Africa. <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's, it's not possible. So it was just, I mean, but it's a, we, it's a we can give it a good try, Boris. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I to I get busy, I, bro. I, I don't think uh, that not, not many whites are Catholics. So they, they could, I think Catholics are a minority of white people in South Africa. But uh, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's. You just have to check it, just like this complete cynicism. And we've also seen with what Julius Malema has been saying. You know, all these pie in the sky promises, you know, everybody will have a job, everybody will have a decent house and whatever. Obviously, these are what we need to aim for, but the government can't do these things. The, exactly. only way that, the only way that every South African can have a job and a decent place to live is if the economy is growing and there's investment in South Africa. The government cannot provide this for everybody. The, what exactly. the government can do is create an environment for these things to happen, for business to, to to be created for business to be successful for mm -hmm. people to get employed and that that is actually that that is the the my the, the the only problem actually in south africa i mean obviously that's not quite true but the problem with every single policy it should be how will this reduce unemployment in south africa every single policy in south africa when it's implemented how is this going to create more jobs that is all we have to worry about because our other problems they obviously won't go away magically but things like poverty inequality and so on if we have if we if we had 10 percent unemployment instead of 42 and uh, percent unemployment whatever it is things like poverty and inequality would be far less uh, problems that there are not that i mean we can also have a chat about inequality inequality is not in uh, of itself a problem it's mm. a problem when there's uh, large numbers of people living in poverty and 
you know, uh, others who aren't create resentment and all kinds of things. We don't have to get into that here. But yeah, I think it's just the, you know, typical cynicism of uh, Julius Malema. He's knowing he, all he, it, it, I think it's the, the, the Russian uh, um, dissident, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, I think you say his name. Mm -hmm. He says something like, uh, you know, we know they're lying. They know that we know they're lying, but they're still lying and we're still nodding along to it. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what it is. Everybody knows Julius Malema is talking nonsense here. Mm -hmm. so we just nod along and he knows we know he's talking nonsense. But it just goes and he says all this kind of rubbish, which, you know, promises that he can never keep. And again, maybe as my last gasp before I, I, I head around the room um, for last words, you know, my vision, I have a vision of a South Africa where we are building strong families, um, which are led by individuals, capacitated, uh, free, able to pursue their own happiness, pursue opportunity, earn an income, uh, to then form these strong families, dual home, dual income households, um, God-fearing South Africans, whatever your particular religion may be, whether you're Muslim, shout out to my Muslim folks, um, Jewish community, Christians, Hindi, whatever, Angandab. The point is God-fearing South Africans, law-abiding, and of course those same individuals who are family-orientated, recognizing that they're raising the next generation of South Africans. Those are the South Africans that I feel should be capacitated, supported, and given in a free uh, society, Morris, as you rightly point out, should have the freedom to pursue their own opportunities in a market economy, the freedom to trade, the freedom to grow an income, build wealth, and literally prosper. That's the society I want to own. Uh, pardon me, that's the society I want to grow and be a part of. And that's what I'm, unfortunately, when I listen to our politicians across the spectrum, I don't hear that rhetoric from them. Um, fellas, as we conclude, we're in the last three minutes. Um, I'm going to go around the table. Nicholas, uh, what are you guys up to this week? What can we expect from the Daily Friend or Two Crickets? Well, Daily Friend will be covering uh, everything that's going on um, <clears throat> in the news and giving you some sort of analysis and the occasional rant on that sort of stuff, although nothing to match the tremendous magnificence of your uh, furious rant that you just had there, Sikle, which was a masterclass. Um, as for two crickets and a thorn tree, Gabriel has been eating interesting things again, and so he is once again uh, under the weather. Uh, so <laughs> there, <laughs> there won't be an episode for, I guess it's technically last week, but we'll try to do one, I think, on Friday or on the weekend. Um, yeah, so we might cover what's going on in the US and the weirdness about their inflation stuff, I think. Uh, is hey, I hope you guys talk about the, the supply chain uh, nonsense there and the comments by Peter uh, Buttigieg, I don't know how to pronounce that douchebag surname, uh, their version of the Minister of Transport, uh, saying it's a good thing that the ships are unable to unload and there's high inflation because it means people are spending money again. What nonsense is that? I hope you guys chat about yeah, that. There's, yeah, it's crazy. Anyway, go uh, on. <laughs> uh, Marius, Brother, what can we expect from you? What's our, our cooking up? I know you guys have a campaign at the moment. Uh, maybe I should have you guys on the show sometime this week to chat about it, about the National Corona, uh, pardon me. The, yeah, I'm right. The National Coronavirus Command Council that, um, COP, uh, what's it? Um, uh, NCC, NCCC, whatever. NCCC, yeah. There we go. Um, uh, I'll be honest, Jan, so that is uh, Gabriel being the best person to have on that, seeing as he's... Uh, Busy <laughs> so, but I think yeah, there'll be there's been quite a lot of stuff in the media uh, around that. So people just keep an eye out out uh, for it. And if people want to go find out a bit more about the campaign and see how they can support it, they can go to the website iwr.org.za and have a look there. And of course, the campaign is that the NC Triple C must be disbanded. Um, yeah, that, that's okay. there there we go, there we go. and all that. Just on one point, uh, yeah, our, um Rate of uh, COVID hospital hospitalizations is now the lowest it's been since April 2020, since before yes. the first wave started. So there's actually no reason to be in any kind of lockdown or any restrictions or whatever. I mean, obviously, still take precautions, you know, wash your hands and whatever. But I mean, it's ridiculous that we have any kinds of restrictions on our movements and so on. After that. Absolutely. I mean, the stuff you mentioned doesn't even need a lockdown at all. I mean, lockdowns in and of themselves, uh, as numerous studies have proven, do not bloody work. What's called non-pharmaceutical interventions have been shown by numerous, numerous studies that actually just and, did not and do not work. And they harm um, poorer South Africans more than anybody else. Absolutely, absolutely. We'll look out for that campaign and hopefully you'll have Oprah Gabriel once he's uh, <laughs> dealt with the stomach flu. Um, uh, Gideon, Homi, Paratus, and of course, 
uh, you fellas down there at uh, what's that gun shop? You're doing some really great work uh, uh, out CH- there. CHS, though we've got a lot of training, uh, and November is going to be chock a block full. We've got three courses coming up, but oh, nice. I will I will keep you in the loop with them. I'll send you the details. Um, so I don't want to really self promote, but I want to leave on a on a on a note. No, of please do, dude. Please what do. what people what people that no, I, I do want it, but <laughs> what people can do, starting with themselves, and I'll define exactly what it means: develop a combative mindset. What that means is not to fight people. It is a rational decision you take beforehand to do whatever it takes to prevail over circumstances. This means equipping yourself with the knowledge, the skills, and the attitude to face the the, the problems that you're going to deal with. And in the Republic of South Africa, that's a lot of stuff. Start by getting to know your neighbors. Secure your family. Figure out how to stop bleeds. Basic first aid. Learn how to protect Mm -hmm. yourselves and others. Build a community spirit. So if your neighbor slips and falls in the shower or cuts themselves open, you are seconds away from being able to help them as opposed to minutes away being in an ambulance. Start Start that kernel of a community structure and then scale it up with time. But you have to start somewhere. And it's as simple as taking ownership over the things you can control and mitigating the things you can't. That is what, that's where you start changing this country, one person at a time. Absolutely, brother. Fully agreed with that. I am driving down to Cape Town, Western Cape on Sunday, and I should be in Cape Town for about two weeks or so. So I'll definitely hit you guys up um, and let's uh, let's do some, uh, let's get you guys on, on the BDL show again, especially that wonderful shop that you're working with at the moment. Do more. Um, brother, what can we expect on Iman Patreon? And of course, that new show of yours. I shouldn't say new anymore. It's quite established now. Uh, that looks at all <laughs> It's quite established. <laughs> yes. Um, all right. So we, we, I have been like on some sort of recess, um, uh, for a while. Um, work has been a bit hectic, but, um, what we plan to do is have a live stream this week. We want to talk about that, um, that ruling that was made by the Eastern ha- Eastern Cape High Court, where I think it was um, a, a rape case and so forth, we just want to we're going to talk about that soon. Uh, just talking about the leg- the legal issues and legalities of consent and everything like that. But you want to get back into it, get the podcast out again. Um, sorry to the fans who love to listen to us. I do know we've been quiet, but uh, you know uh, we are going to do some you know, great stuff this week and release some excellent content. So thanks for the patience as well. Fantastic. That is, of course, Udumo Denga, the host of the Man Patriot Show. Uh, big thanks to him and Gideon, or Gideon, as I like to say, on the Khan Afrikaans Prat, and Gideon as Afrikaans. Um, and of course, Marius Ruth, as, um, oh, Marius Ruth, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and of course, there he is, Nicholas Lorimer, uh, from two crickets in a thorn tree. Very big thanks to all of my guests, including <clears throat> Ian Cameron from Action Society, who had to leave at nine o'clock. And of course, thank you, uh, dear viewer, for watching this episode. Apologies for not doing it on its usual Sunday slot, and it happened to, it happened on a Monday uh, evening. I hope you enjoyed it. Please, guys, pop a comment in the comment section. Let me know how, uh, how pardon me, let me know <laughs> um, uh, what sort of topics you also do want to see on the show. I'm seeing some of your suggestions too. Uh, shout out to you. I can't remember your name, but who asked me to timestamp um, the video so that you can uh, jump to particular topics on it. We'll definitely get on to that. Thank you very much for that uh, suggestion. And uh, Deborah Olifia, by thank you for the honor of stealing um, that 140 round. I do appreciate that. And if you want to support the BDL show, all of those details are in the descriptor of the videos. It literally goes into the diesel in my bucky to travel around this country. Lots of exciting stuff coming out. I keep saying this, but I'm still doing a lot of the planning in the background. Um, please expect the Mazakele campaign very soon. Um, and that special mini series on the effects of uh, lockdown on the tourism, I finished shooting that. I'm, that's why I'm heading down to Cape Town. I want to wrap up shooting that, and that's coming soon too. With that being said, thanks for watching. Lutando Maki, I see you in the comment section. Thank you very much. Hopefully I'll get to meet you as I head down to the Western Cape. And uh, thank you again for watching the show. And as a reminder to you, On every show at the end, never trust a commie.